Hello, I'm Bruce Canepa, and I'd like to welcome all the Peterson Museum fans to our facility in Northern California. Um, we have a rainy day, and of course it's all quiet with all that's going on in the world right now. I hope you're all healthy and being safe, so we're going to take you on a tour of our facility. The first part of the facility we're going in here is the showroom. These are all cars that we basically offer for sale. For us, it's all about quality, uh, not quantity. It's about the history of the cars, the condition of the cars, how well they're maintained, how well they're restored, how original they are. We really only want to buy the best and offer the best cars in the world to our customers. I've always liked lots of cars, different kinds. Um, most people know I'm a Porsche fan first and foremost, but you know, I like hot rods and I like Shelby's and I like some Ferraris and I like uh, Lamborghinis and I like trucks and I like motorcycles. So I guess I'm a car guy. Um, I have been since I was four and uh, I've always liked a little bit of everything. I, I, for me, it's more about the, the, the history of the car, the condition of the car, um, the quality, the performance, uh, a little bit of all that. And then as we grow up and spend a lifetime with these cars, it becomes all about the people. And uh, we meet so many great people. We've shared so many fun events with people. Um, I think that's what we enjoy and, and look forward to more than anything at this point. And, and the car culture has grown uh, over the years with all the historic car races and road events and car shows and concourses and cars and coffees. It's really made the cars a lot more popular and, and brought you know hundreds of thousands of people together. We're gonna showcase a few cars before we leave the showroom. Um, this is the new Ford GT, and uh, these have only been out a few years. These are magnificent cars, this new car. It's one of the coolest sports cars I've ever seen. This particular car belongs to Chip Ganassi. There's a Chip Ganassi display at the Peterson ongoing right now. Chip is, uh, uh, you know, is he, he owns a championship Indi Indianapolis car team. They've won the Indy 500. They've won the championship numerous times. He has an NASCAR team. But he was also the team that brought the Ford GT back to racing uh, four years ago now and won the 24-hour Le Mans, won the 24-hour Daytona, uh, won, won almost every major race. And, um, and this is his personal Ford GT, which Chip doesn't have time for road cars. Everybody asked me why he would sell his car. I said, well, he spends all his time in the seat of an airplane. He goes from his house to the Indianapolis shops to the North Carolina shops to the races. So, and if you ask him, he'll just tell you he's got plenty of cars with numbers on them in the shops. Here's another car that, uh, that I really like. Um, and as you know, I've told you I'm a Porsche fan. This is a 964 RS. These are extremely rare. This particular car belonged to Jerry Seinfeld. We've done a number of cars with Jerry over the years. And fortunately, he, he sometimes has too many cars, so we get some of them back. But this is a very, very low mileage, extremely rare color. And the 964 RS is really the modern day Carrera RS. It's light, it has great horsepower, handles amazing, sounds great. It's an air-cooled car. Um, it, it really kind of checks every box for what a sports car should be. A couple of cool things before we go. This is a McLaren P1 GTR. There's only 50, a little over 50 of these in the world. It's a thousand horsepower car. It's just an amazing piece of equipment in terms of handling and performance. It's a zero to 60, just over two second car. It, I, I can't say enough about it. It's, uh, it's just, it, they're awesome. And, and I think they're awesome looking too. McLaren has done such an incredible job getting into the car world and coming up with some great road cars in such a short period of time. To, on the other side here is a BMW M1. I, I had the first one of these that I owned was in 1981. I've always liked this car. It's really, it's BMW's only supercar in their whole history. It was a composite body car, it was very lightweight, had overhead cam, 300 horsepower engine, and design-wise, they're timeless. And drivability, they're awesome. They really drive more like a modern car than, a, than an 80s car. And then the last thing I'm gonna point out is the two Cobras. Um, I've been a Cobra fan since the late 60s. Um, these were always dream cars for myself and a lot of other people. I do own one today. 
Um, we have both versions here. This is a 289 Cobra and totally restored. You know, just those cars are as, as uh, timeless as you get. And then, then this is a, a 427 Cobra. And the 427's really got pretty, uh, pretty awesome looking. They got the fenders got flared out and the body got a little wider. And of course they got a big engine and, and they just, uh, they, they look like they're just kind of ready to drip everything right on the ground. And, and these cars are amazing because they were, they were you know, just in the low 2000 pound range, 400 plus horsepower in these cars. Um, they literally would dust a Corvette in a second. I mean, uh, there was no competition. And in fact, there was a story a long time ago where a Cobra would do zero to 100 and back to zero in 12 seconds. So um, really a timeless piece of history, especially when you tie Carroll Shelby to it. He's the one that made this car uh, a reality for everybody to enjoy and drive. And, and um, I, don't, I don't think I could ever get tired of a Cobra. All right, it's time to leave the showroom. We'll head to the museum and we'll see a bunch of race cars. So welcome to our museum. This museum is a collection of cars that I've been putting together for over 30 years. Um, I've always been involved in racing, raced myself, and I've loved all forms of racing, from drag racing to road racing to Indianapolis to uh, kind of you name it. Um, I don't think there's any kind of racing I don't like. The museum really represents a variety of all these different disciplines. There's cars here from Pikes Peak, from drag racing, from NASCAR, from Le Mans, from Indy, etc. And uh, we'll kind of walk through it and I'll point out some of the different cars so you uh, see what they are and, uh, and, and can enjoy them. Okay, so the first car you see here this is a car that was built at uh, my shops in 79. We took this car to Pikes Peak, um, set a record with it at Pikes Peak in 79 or in 1980. And it was, a, it was something I'd never done before and we just wanted to do that. And that's when Pikes Peak was really a gravel road, which was pretty exciting. And it's a thousand pound car, has 400 horsepower, Porsche engine. Um, it, was, uh, it was a pretty fun time. And then as we go further, this whole line here, as you go down, you're gonna see Porsches. I mean, again, I'm a Porsche fan. So we have a, a variety of Porsches. This first RSR, this was the first RSR built at Porsche. It was the factory team car. It won the championship and the won the class at Le Mans. And I think this car has been in the collection since the 80s. So been here quite a while. Um, the next Porsche is a single turbo Porsche 934 and a half. There were 10 of these cars built for IMSA. Um, I actually purchased this car when it was used. It was a year old when I purchased it, had very few races on it. It was the first road race car that I actually raced professionally. And um, this car uh, ended its career in 79, finishing third overall at the 24 hour Daytona. Uh, my co-drivers were Rick Mears and Monty Shelton and uh, none of us had ever been to Daytona and we, uh, we really had a bunch of fun doing that. The next Porsche is, is one of the last of the 935 era. Uh, this was one of Reinhold Yost cars, a Liquamali car, um, factory 935 um, with, with all the Yost body work that the factory authorized him to do. This car has a lot of race wins and, and podium finishes on it. Um, and this was the, you know, one of the coolest eras of, of road racing because these cars were 750 horsepower, they slid around the corners. They, you know, you drove them with a lot of throttle oversteer. They're really a beast, no question. The ultimate Porsches, the 917s, there's two of them here. Um, the first car here is the Daytona winner from 1970. Um, it was the first long distance win for the 917. It was a Gulf, Gulf Wire car driven by Pedro Rodriguez and Lee Kuhneman and Brian Redman. And uh, there, there is no more beautiful car in the world, I don't think, than a Porsche 917. And in a lot of ways, there's no better performance car than a 917. The second 917 here is the Can-Am version. And they were, the Can-Am version car was used in, uh, the, in the Can-Am series in the United States and the inner series in Europe. And uh, um, these were basically the same chassis as the coupe you just saw, but the Can-Am version is wider because it has wider wheels and tires, a wider body. It has a twin turbo engine making over 1200 horsepower. Um, these cars, even by today's standards, are some of the fastest race cars of all time. They're zero to 100 in 2.8 seconds. They were zero to 150 in five and a half seconds. And they were zero to 200 in 10.8 in, in 10 seconds. And uh, 
there's just not much that competes with that in terms of performance, not even today. And of course, today cars have changed because of safety standards and all kinds of other restrictions. And in this era, there was basically no rules that you could kind of race whatever you could imagine. Then the last Porsche is the beginning of the era of ground effects cars. So this is a Porsche 962 C. Uh, this was a championship car from Jackie Ickes and Jochen Moss when, when they won the championship in the Rothman cars. Rothman was a factory sponsor for Porsche. This was a factory team car. These cars, even again by today's standards, are extremely fast. The cars, the, the newest race cars today have been slowed down some because of safety, but these cars generated 750 to 850 horsepower. They made, you know, five, six, seven thousand pounds of downforce and um, uh, had incredible grip through the corners and, and really was an era of the, of the coolest looking prototype cars in the world. As we go through the rest of the museum, you just see a variety of things, again, because I like stuff. So this is an AMC Javelin, 1970. Roger Penske took over the AMC Javelin factory works racing program to race in Trans Am. This was a Trans Am car driven first by Mark Donahue, then by Peter Revson. But uh, this, was, this was a muscle car racing series and it was a really exciting series then. It included Mustangs and Camaros and, and Dodge Challengers and, and Chargers and, and, and of course Javelin. So a little bit of everything, Pontiac Firebirds, all of it. And, and Roger by the second year with the Javelin program, he won the championship with the car. So pretty, pretty cool car. Um, this car here on the left, this is an H production, all original Austin Healey. It was in a garage in the Midwest. It raced at Elkhart Lake uh, Racetrack um, Road America from 1959 to 1967. The guy towed it to the track with a trailer hitch, took the windshield off and raced it. And kind of the purest form of racing, you know, you kind of load up your car, drag it down to the track, drive it and drag it home, you know, if you didn't wreck it. So, um, and then the car next to it is another, Another of that era where this is a Fiat 600 made into a race car by Abarth. These cars were a thousand pounds, made a made hundred horsepower, won lots of races. They were actually extremely competitive. Very cool looking little cars, a very timeless look, this little box. So um, I just always like this kind of stuff. Um, we'll flip over here. Um, open wheel cars. Um, the Cooper here in front of me, this was Steve McQueen's car. It was originally the Cooper Championship car in Europe. Um, Ken Tyrrell ran the team for John Cooper. They won the championship. The car at the end of that season was sold to Steve McQueen, who drove it a little bit in Europe and drove it in the United States until he needed to be making movies and not racing cars. But uh, this was uh, an early air open wheel car. These cars are light and nimble and fun and and, uh, and pretty timeless when you consider this is a 60s car. The car next to it is Dan Gurney's first Indy car. Uh, this is chassis 01. This is the car he drove in Indianapolis in 1966. Um, and this car raced actually five years at Indianapolis 500 in different configurations. And um, we were able to acquire this car, I think three or four years ago and then we restored it complete ground up. So you see it in a completely fresh restored state. Um, Dan Gurney created all American racers, um, you know, Southern California guys building race cars. Their quality was impeccable. Their designs were impeccable. This Eagle with the, with the beak nose was one of the most beautiful Indy cars of all time and extremely successful in that era. Over here we have a, a taste of NASCAR. So this is a 1969 Ford 427 Torino. 69 was the only year that uh, Richard Petty drove Fords. He knew that the Dodge was not going to be competitive, the Chrysler product against the Fords, so he switched over to Fords. He drove this car at Riverside um, in the Times 500 in 69 and won the race. And um, he drove Fords all the rest of that year. And then this car here is a sprint car. And I have to say that in my racing that I did over the years, all the different cars I got to drive, these were the most fun of anything I ever drove. Um, a sprint car weighs approximately 1,200 pounds, has 850 horsepower. Uh, they, they had 800 horsepower even back then. Uh, they run on methanol, there's no transmission, you push them to start them, and you race on oval tracks. Um, anything from a quarter mile to a mile, uh, oval, mostly dirt. This is all in dirt car configuration. You're sideways all the time. Sometimes you're upside down. 
but these are the most fun of anything I ever drove. And probably a sprint car teaches you more car control than anything in the world for driving. Um, you know, Tony Stewart drove sprint cars, AJ Foyt, Mario Andretti, Jeff Gordon. I mean, the list goes on and on. Most guys that were great race car drivers came out of, out of something in the dirt like this. Now we got an example of a Bonneville car. So this is, this car raced at Bonneville in 1953. It was about 170, over 170 miles an hour. I mean, this is a 33, 34 Ford body chopped way down. You didn't need, you only needed to look forward. Um, about 400 horsepower with a supercharged flathead Ford engine with Arden heads. Um, you know, a really, you know, th this was the hot rod generation. This was a lot of guys from Southern California, you know, figuring out how to make cars go fast. That's, that's probably one of the best examples of that right there. So this is an Audi. This is an R15 TDI. This, this is a contemporary race car. This entire car is made out of carbon fiber. This entire car has sophisticated electronics for everything from traction control to ABS to yaw to you name it. Uh, performance maps everything. This is a diesel powered car. And these cars in just a few years basically won everything. They won every major race including the 24 hour Le Mans. Nothing could compete with these cars for quite some time. This is the only example of one of these in a museum. Uh, the rest are still in the ownership of Audi at this point. But, uh, a really incredible piece of technology and you can kind of see how race cars change. They got longer, bigger, wider, lower and, and the entire design is really based on aerodynamics. So it's not, not somebody sitting down with a pencil and designing a pretty car. It's uh, engineers and aerodynamicists saying this is what it needs to look like to go fast. This is a sports racer and these cars even by today's standards are extremely quick. They were very light, they had great handling made about 350 horsepower in a car that's just over a thousand pounds. Really popular today in vintage racing. This was a championship car driven by Jochen Moss and George Burl in the 70s, I think got 72. Um, it, was a, it was a world championship car. Just, just a really cool car. These cars are so simple. They're just, you know, um, if you talk about less is more, this is less is more right here. And then next to it, we have the complete extreme. We have you know, in the heyday of NASCAR, this is a Dale Earnhardt car from 1987. Uh, this is chassis number two. This is a super speedway car. So this was a 200 mile an hour brick, basically. These cars weigh 3,500 pounds, have about 800 horsepower back then, and very few limitations. I mean, if you could go 200, you went 200. This, this was the 200 mile an hour era in all their cars back then. And then here we have a 90s era IndyCar. Um, IndyCars today have changed dramatically based on safety requirements. This is an era where they were building cars through the 80s and 90s, well, really earlier than that, but 70s, 80s, 90s, and the entire goal was to see how fast you could go. And this, this was a car that was built in an era where 230 mile an hour at Indianapolis 500 was kind of normal stuff. Um, this car was driven by Ari Leindyke, I think this car finished third at Indianapolis back then, won the Phoenix mile race in that era. Um, this was a Granatelli car, so this was Vince Granatelli and Ari drove for him. And uh, the, the, these cars were just minimalist. Uh, the cockpit is just barely big enough for a driver. There's just barely enough car in the front for his feet. Um, you know, just, there's just nothing on this car that doesn't need to be on this car for going fast. It's all about going fast. Then over here, We've got three cars of the, of the 60s era for dirt and pavement. You know, this first car is a sprint car, a championship sprint car driven by a guy named Donnie Branson. He was as good as there was in these cars in that era. Unfortunately, he didn't survive uh, these cars. These cars, the fatality rate was fairly high. They were pretty dangerous. They were extremely fast. But this was a car that, that uh, you know, people would have seen at Ascot Park in, in Southern California. And, in car scenario to go. If you went to Ascot in the 60s, you saw this car race with Donnie in the car. The next car is a dirt champ car. So the, these, these were a combination car. These cars raced on the mile at Terre Haute on a dirt track, and two days later they'd be on a two mile pavement track. This car raced not only at the Hoosier 100, it raced at the Indy 500. And it was as simple as changing the gear ratios, the torsion bars, the shocks and the tires, 
and the car was ready to go for the Indy 500. Um, this was the Parnelli Jones car, had multiple wins at the Hoosier 100, was one of the last conventional cars to qualify for the Indy 500 before the Roadster era started. And, um, and that's what this is. This is an Indy Roadster. So the next generation of cars after that were, was the Roadster. And the Roadster was low. The engine was that same engine, that Offenhauser engine was moved to one side in the car so that the driver could sit really low on the other side of the car. And, and it's funny because you're up against the wall. <laughs> you're, not, you're closer to it instead of farther. But that was the whole idea, was to get the engine, get everything down, get the driver down, get the aerodynamics better. And, the, and, the, and these Indy Roadsters, to me, are some of the most beautiful air Indy cars ever built. They, uh, they just, they're just timeless looking. And these cars back then, these were a 130, 140 mile an hour car down the straightaway in Indianapolis. So they, uh, they, they weren't slow by any means. This is a top fuel dragster from the late 60s. Um, th this, was, this took the bravest of all dragster drivers to drive these. The engine was in front of you, making 3,000 horsepower on nitro. Things would blow up and come back towards your face. Fire came back towards your face. Parts came back towards your face. Um, I mean, you really, this really was an era of really brave guys. You sat in the seat with the, with the differential right in front of you um, and, and the axles. I mean, literally your legs went over the axle housing. And this particular car was driven by a really good friend of mine. This was Don Perdome, Don the Snake Perdome. This was a car he drove. He drove a number of these cars in that era. He won, God, you can't count how many races he won. He was pretty much fearless in this era in these cars and you had to be. And um, um, I was fortunate in that we were able to get this car from the owners. Don restored this car in its entirety with a lot of the same guys that were involved when it was built new. You know, from Ed Pink re rebuilt the engine and Don Long re restored the chassis back and the original painters and the original tin guys, or at least four of the guys that were part of this car in the 60s were part of it three years ago when it went through the restoration. So um, this, is, uh, th this car means a lot to me. Don and I are good friends, like I said, and it's, he's come up here to the, we've taken this downstairs for a cars and coffee and fired it off. And, and it's, uh, if you've ever heard a dragster run, it's, it's pretty exciting to hear one of these things rattle off 3000 horsepower. And the last two cars in the museum we'll look at here is from the, you know, the, the GT era, GTX era, uh, group four, different things, group five, um, extreme opposites, but they raced against each other. This is a 935. This is the last of the series 935s built. This is a K4, Kremer built this car. This is an 800 horsepower car. John Fitzpatrick drove this car in the United States. Bob Wallach drove it in Europe under different sponsorship, but he drove it in Europe. This car has a lot of race wins. I think six in the US alone in IMSA. Um, John and I are friends. We actually drove together before and and John said, by far, the K4 was the fastest, best 935 ever built. And, and he proved it. I mean, he raced against GTP cars with ground effects and beat them on numerous occasions. This car is a Lancia. And Lancia got involved in, in road racing and built this really cool looking car. I love, I love this box. And it's got a four cylinder turbo engine. They, they went for a small motor and a very light package. The car is extremely light very nimble. They were very successful. You know, they lacked a little bit of reliability. That's part of Italian cars, but they, they definitely had the performance and the looks and, and all the other stuff that goes with cool race cars. All right, we're, uh, we're in our shops. This is my favorite part, my favorite place. This is where I try to hang out most of the day. Um, we basically work on, on average, 50 plus projects. Um, you know, sometimes I guess quite a few more than that, but uh, and at least 20, 25% of those projects are ground up restorations, uh, mechanical, cosmetics, you name it. And, and we have in our facilities, as, I, as we walk through here, you'll see we, we do all our own body and paint work. We do metal work of all kinds, fabrication, machining, upholstery work. Um, we have an engine room, which primarily does Porsche engines, but we do other Ferrari engines or Mercedes engines, some other things, but it's mostly about Porsches. We have, we do our own composite work. We basically send very little outside. We send out uh, plating. Uh, I think most everything else 
from machining to fabrication to assembly to you name it is all done here. And, and it allows us to really work together as a team so that the end product is what everybody imagined it should be. Uh, at the quality level, I expect everything to be at. It, it allows us to be more efficient with time because uh, these are complicated projects, especially at the level of detail that we do. We're, we're working, you know, when we take a car apart here, it's every nut and bolt, uh, everything. It's not, it's not take a part off and clean it up and paint it and put it back on. It's disassembled and rebuilt and restored or upgraded or whatever it needs. So um, pretty intense. So. We'll just kind of walk through here and, and this side of the shop over here, this is all mechanical side on this side. And, and it, yes, you'll see a lot of Porsches, but you'll see other things. There's a Jaguar, there's a Ferrari Dino, there's another Ferrari Mondial down there, um, and then Porsches in between. So you, you always see Porsches and then, you, and then you see other things around too. So this first car is kind of cool because it's a very important rally car from the 70s in Europe. It uh, actually, John Todd was the navigator in this car in the, in the day. And rally cars um, are extremely difficult to restore. They have had every square inch of sheet metal on them crashed at some point. You find the floors all smashed in and the sides smashed in and that's part of rally racing as they take a beating. So, so this car is just completing, you know, what we would call a hundred point mechanical and cosmetic restoration. You know, the engine's rebuilt, the gearbox is rebuilt, the chassis is rebuilt, the body and every detail is restored. We've even gone to the trouble, we made sure that it's all graphics are back the way it was. All the radio equipment and the fire system equipment and the navigation equipment in the car is all the way it was in the day. So it's, it's, it's literally like 1974 or five all over again in terms of how this car looks. Uh, uh, part, of, part of the restoration challenge is to put cars back exactly as they were and uh, you know that means finding a CB radio from 1970 something um, all that so that's that's what this car is it's restored basically exactly as it was in the day on the other side of the shop we've got something that's like extremely opposite of that SO Porsche this is a Maybach um, this Maybach belongs to a customer in Southern California it was his father's car and we're making it into what I call hot rod. I like to hot rod cars. So the customer is kind of giving us the go ahead to, to you know, to de-chrome it. We lowered it. We're having seven spoke 20 inch wheels custom made for it. It'll have much wider tires. Um, we've gotten rid of all the extra emblems on it. We basically have really kind of made it stealth looking. Um, and uh, we'll have this car done and delivered in the next uh, month. We're just waiting for wheels now, I think. But uh, we do a lot of projects like this where we completely change a car, customize it, do whatever. And, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of up for the challenge. I like doing things. I mean, if somebody would normally call somebody and say, I want you to customize a Maybach, you'd kind of shake your head. And for me, it's like, oh, that'll be cool. Let's do that. So, so that's what that's all about. Um, anyway, there's, you know, again, lots of Porsches. Here's a whole I think everything in the center aisle is a Porsche, but we have a 918 here for some service work and a, and a, and a Carrera RS for service work. And, and this is one of our 959 projects. Uh, we'll talk about these more later where we disassemble the entire car and rebuild it new again. Um, I mean, this car was originally silver, so now it's, it's like Irish green, a Porsche color. Um, 993, there's a 356 there that we're making into an outlaw. So when we're done with this car, it'll be lowered, six and a half inch steel wheels, fat tires, 150 horsepower. We're doing it all slate gray. It was slate gray originally. We restored the body, have all kinds of suspension upgrades, um, a Carrera bumper trim on it, you know, no, no extra trim on it, really clean and stealth. So I, I love 356 Outlaw cars. We don't have time to build a lot of them and there's, you know, there's some other guys that do it full time and we've got too many other projects, but anytime I can sneak one into my system, we're, we'll build an outlaw for somebody. So um, they're, just, they're just a blast to drive. Um, this yellow car here, this is a 911R. So this is, this is, the, this is the number four 911R. They built four prototypes. Um, they built four of these as prototypes and 20 as customer cars. So this was the lightest of the prototypes. This is an extremely rare car. We restored this car 
oh my god i guess six seven eight years ago for the for the customer that owned it then and then i resold the car to a new customer and we service it and maintain it now and and he actually drives it all the time which is really cool Th this car weighs 1800 pounds with about 230 horsepower and which makes it as much fun as you can have in a car nothing more fun than a really lightweight car with power and uh and it's pretty amazing that that rare collectible car is used on a regular basis as a street driving car. This is a 993 GT2. This is another car that's extremely rare. Um, this is a turbo Porsche air-cooled, wide wheels, big fenders. These are really rare. This car came from Japan. Um, this customer is also from Southern California, and he's having us basically disassemble and restore this car to new. So we've kind of we've repainted it, we're redoing the interior, we've cleaned all the chassis, we're servicing the engine, we're basically putting it back to a, a new condition. These cars are few and far between, they're very collectible, and they're also a lot of fun to drive. So we're in the middle of doing that. And as we walk over here, here's two more ground up restorations going on. Um, and again, it shows you the variety of things we do. I also like Lamborghinis of this era. I like Countach's and Mura's. Those were my favorite Lamborghinis. This is a ground up restoration of a Lamborghini Countach. Um, no wing on the back, no, no louvers and stuff. This is the very early, what I call, you know, understated, timeless design. This car was originally black. We've now made a color, it's dark green. We were doing dark green Alcantara inside and white leather. We rebuilt the engine and it makes more power. We just did a lot of little finesse to the engine. We did the same with the gearbox. We've been through the suspension. This is a complete ground up restoration. Um, just, just almost completed. The Daytona is the same thing. The Daytona is a, is, it was a 12,000 mile car that sat. It, uh, it had no rust, it had no damage, but it sat. It had rats living under the dash and all those ugly kind of stories, but it had original seats that were in great condition. So this is a preservation restoration. We have stripped and repainted the car. We've replated everything. We've restored the original seats, the original door panels, um, all those things. It will have new carpet. We, we've serviced the engine and you know, we're getting, this car is now in the, in the final stages of completion now. So um, behind you is our upholstery shop. So all our upholstery, as I said, was done in house. We have a, a gentleman that is just unbelievable at doing this trim work. He's done it all his life. I mean, he hand stitches steering wheels and, and uh, you know, whatever it is, he can do it. Uh, um, there's parts all over the place here that he's done for these cars. So, because we, in the 959s, we completely retrim the entire interior. Most of these restorations, we redo the entire interiors in them also. And, uh, and that's, and he's got skivers and he's got everything he needs here to do whatever process he needs for upholstery. And then in the corner over here, um, and all these parts go for this car, and, and you get a sense here what we do. Every, every part is completely restored. You know, these are control arms, all new bearings, all new seals, um, all the marks have been taken out of them. They're replated back to the original CAD finishes. Um, you know, all the arms, every little thing here. The shocks are the original shocks completely rebuilt because you can't buy those shocks anymore. The steering racks rebuilt. Um, you, can, you look on the shelves and there's just tons of parts, rear suspension, brake calipers, fuel systems, exhaust, everything completely restored. And like I said, every nut and bolt is restored. These parts are for GT40. This is an original GT40 Ford in uh, 1960. Six, I think it is, 66, 67. Um, and we're doing a ground up restoration. And, and these cars were notorious for having rust. They really had no way for the water to drain out of them. They're steel tubs. So the floors would be rusted out and the, and the sills would be rusted out and the, and the bulkheads would be rusted out in the bottom. Usually you'll find the bottom two inches of these cars is pretty bad. So we reformed all those pieces from scratch. We made tooling to make the ribs. We wanted to get this car exactly as it was new, um, right down to the color and the, and the materials for the seats and, and everything. This, this car is, uh, it's, uh, there's a great picture of this car in, I think, 1967 at Laguna Seca. It's the pace car for the USSRC race and, and um, Sterling Moss is gonna drive it as the pace driver. James Garner, the actor, was riding in it. 
and it had a paper sign on the door that said cars for rent or lease S&C Ford. And, um, and I think the sign needs to go back on the car. But you know, this is a project we're doing for a customer and, and uh, we're, really, we're really excited we're doing it. We've never restored an original GT40. This is something new for us. There's, uh, there's, there's one other guy I know in the United States that restores these really perfectly. And he's helped us with all the details of what to do and where to find things. But uh, um, we're having fun because this car, this car probably had as many original parts on it since it sat in a garage most of its life as any GT40 that's ever been restored. And that's a rare thing to have original parts. So this is the body and paint shop area. And um, this is where everything gets shiny and colors on it. But uh, we do all our own metal work here, all, all forms of metal work. Um, you know, this, this, that's a 934 and a half in restoration right there. Um, there's, you can see parts. I mean, I tell guys, most, most of the cars we do, it's all done in parts. You don't really paint whole cars. You paint the fenders and the doors and the hoods and the wings and the whatever else. It's all in pieces. Um, I, I don't remember when we've ever taped off and painted a car as one piece. Everything's disassembled. Um, this, this is a project for a customer. This is going to be a, um, a basically a custom a pretty cool custom. We're doing a 67 Cadillac Eldorado. We're reshaping the bumpers. We've restyled the grill. We've restyled the hood, the quarter panels, the rear of the car. It'll be pretty low to the ground. It'll have 20 inch machined aluminum wheels. It'll be done in a black liquid metal color. I mean, it's, it's a complete custom. And, and this is another thing that we don't typically do. But this customer asked if we would build one. Uh, for me, it was like, yeah, I, I kind of know what I think that should look like, so we're doing it. And uh, um, all the guys in-house, we have a lot of really creative guys, so I can throw out a lot of ideas and, and they can turn it into a finished product. And, uh, and that, that'll be a perfect example. Th this is a 959 sitting here. And, and again, I said, we'll talk about these later. All these parts, this bumper, these doors, this hood. This is a 959 body or tub, whatever you want to call it. We, we, we take these down to an empty body, completely strip the body as you can see here, and then restore the car and upgrade the car to brand new. So, and every one of these comes out to some custom color, a Porsche sample color, but they will let the customers pick the color. So this is a body in process right now. We have two paint booths for painting all the parts. Uh, typically the booths are full of parts, completely full all the time. You know, whether it's a body or whether it's all the miscellaneous parts. So we're, we're literally painting all day, every day. This is probably my favorite car. And, uh, and we've spent 30 years hanging out with these cars. This, these are Porsche 959s. I drove one in 87 when they were first built. And we've been playing with them ever since. We, uh, we figured out how to make them emissions legal for the United States. We figured out how to get them in the country. Um, and then from there, we've just kind of tweaked them and updated them and, uh, you know, done the hot rod routine to everything in this car. Um, uh, about three years ago, three plus years ago, um, because they were they're th over 30 years old, we decided to take one completely apart, every nut and bolt and evaluate every part in it. And uh, we'd already been doing updates to suspension and tires and brakes and things, but we, we went we went completely through the car. and. When we got done, we, we really had what we call today the reimagined version, uh, the 959 SC. And the reality is, is that we, there's, it's the same car. It's a Porsche 959. It's an original Porsche 959. We have basically restored it, rebuilt it, and upgraded it to what we would think the 959 would be similar if it were built today. Um, fortunately, the body design of this car is timeless. When I drive my car, people think it's a new Porsche. It's funny, they, they almost look at me like I have no idea what I'm talking about when I tell them it's 30 years old. The body's pretty timeless, but so are all the driving characteristics of this car. It was 20 years ahead of its time when it was built. And so really, we only had to catch up 10 years the way I looked at it when we got really going with all these changes. So today, it's an 800 horsepower car. It now has 18 inch magnesium wheels came with 17s. It's got upgraded brake rotors and hats and pads. Basically, all the suspension's upgraded with titanium springs and modern shock valving. We strip them down to a bare tub and repaint them custom colors. This customer, you know, wanted this is a Porsche color from the 70s, 
uh, Viper Green. And we're doing one there that's granite metallic. That's a Porsche color. There's a pearl white one there. Um, there's, there's an Irish green one there, basically. Um, we've done navy blue. We've done seal gray. We've done liquid metal. Uh, we've built uh, where I think we're now in the numbers 12, 13, 14, somewhere in there. But they're all custom one-off cars. We try to not duplicate anything in terms of colors. We completely redo the interiors. Uh, not only is it all new leather, this car happens to have tobacco brown leather with green stitching, but everything's leather. So every piece in it that might have been plastic or metal is covered in leather. So it's 100% leather interior. We upgrade the stereo systems using Porsche's new uh, classic radio with, with the best of speakers and amps, etc. cetera. Um, we basically create a new car out of this. Um, every single piece of hardware is replated. Everything re is powder coated. Every finish is redone. There's not a single part on the car that's not new in terms of condition. And the nicest thing is, is that this car is as fast as almost any modern supercar. It's a zero to 60, two and a half second car. It does a quarter mile in the high nines. It's, it's got a top speed of 230 mile an hour. So it's plenty fast, but it's also comfortable, luxurious, quiet if you want to be quiet. You can put luggage in it, got great visibility. I call it the most user-friendly, fast car in the world. And most supercars that are cool are, I mean, they're really cool, but I, I say you, they're not practical to decide, well, we're gonna go to dinner or we're gonna drive to LA or something in them. This car is a, it's a Porsche. And with a Porsche, it's made for a driver, which means you can go anywhere you wanna go, as far as you wanna go. And so, as you can see, there's, Four of these here, there's always three or four in the system as we're building them. Um, here's one over here. There's parts there for, you know, going to being taken apart. Here's parts all restored for this car. I mean, and you can kind of get a sense that every individual part is restored to new. Every piece of aluminum, every bushing, every seal, every plated part, everything is put back to brand new on the cars. Um, this one here, of course, this, is, this customer picked granite green and we're doing a custom matching leather in the car. Um, and here you get a sense of how far apart they were. And, you, and as you can see, nothing in the car looks used. Every, everything, there's 2,000 pieces of just plated stuff that has to be replated. All the insulations are done new, all the hoses, all the coatings, all of it. The, these arms, which were originally painted, are now powder coated. So um, we really are restoring, rebuilding these to a concourse show car quality and yet it's a car you could drive every day and go anywhere you want to go so here's the engine bay it 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 basically looks the same as a stock 959 we did we didn't want to change it these, these finishes this champagne color and these grays that's porsche factory colors this tube is 60 percent more air volume same with this hose that had to be remolded and remade because we're making that much more power the turbochargers are modern they're borg warner the air conditioning compressor is new the power steering pumps upgraded um, there's no more plug wires there's no more coils hanging on the engine there's no more distributor it's all like a modern car it's coil packs so you get rid of all that stuff um, the engine the wiring harnesses are all new because it's a new engine management system so the injectors are new the ignitions new so you know the engine is completely it's the same engine it's still a 2.8 liter engine um, but it's 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 upgraded now to like i said 800 just over 800 horsepower it's actually 950 horsepower on e85 and um, and it's got 650 plus foot pounds of torque and and as you can see every finish is like it's a brand new car everything every little piece every rubber seal insulation every finish here everything is back to brand new we don't want anything on the car to look like like it was ever driven when when it leaves here just to give you an idea this is a car that's two-thirds done these projects average over 4,000 hours to do a 959 sc it's uh it's somewhere between 4,000 if we're really quick and 4,300 plus hours to do each car um, you know, there, there's a lot to this car with the all-wheel drive systems, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what it takes to do one. And then, you know, and, and then everything, you know, is, is refinished, restored, remade. We're buying the nice, the finest leathers in the world in terms of leather quality. Um, you know, it's just, uh, 
you can kind of get a sense looking at it, but when we're done, it's a new car. You don't look at anything in it that's not been touched and rebuilt and, and gone through in the car. Everything is restored and upgraded to new. Heading back this way, we're entering basically what we call our fabrication machine shop. And, and the guys that work in this department basically can make things, whether it's a machine process or a fabrication process, um, a casting of something, a tooling for something, you know, all the modifications, everything, that's all done in here. We, they kind of have all the different equipment they need from mills to lathes to, to English wheels to power hammers so they can, so they can make things. And that just extends further back into here. Um, we keep running out of space in this facility, but back in here there's more of that same where we're, where we're making things all the time. And uh, um, here's an example over here. Um, one of the fabricators that works in this area, he makes all of the fabricated parts for the 959 engine. So these are equal length stainless steel headers that he's building right here. So the headers that were on these cars were not very efficient. We've, we've figured out how to pick up about 20 horsepower just in this exhaust part. So we, every car gets a brand new set of exhaust manifolds. You can see them kind of stacked up here. And then as you head back this way, we got engines everywhere. So this, this whole area is full of engines. You know, there's Ferrari engines, a 917 engine in here, a Bugatti EB110 engine, um, and a lot of Porsche engines. So this is our engine assembly shop. And um, the, uh, the, the lion's share of the work in here is rebuilding the 959 engines. These engines get completely disassembled down to the case and rebuilt with new connecting rods, new pistons, new valves, new valve springs, new cams, new everything. And uh, every part of it crack checked and x-rayed and cleaned, etc. These engines were 450 horsepower when they were new. They're a 2.8 liter engine and, and when we're completed with them, they're making 800 plus horsepower on pump gas, 91 octane fuel and 650 foot pounds of torque. And of course, a big part of that is modern turbochargers and ignition systems and injectors and all the stuff that's available now. So this side of the facility is the motorsports shop. And uh, um, basically everything related to the race cars, whether it's restoration, whether it's mechanical repairs, whether it's service, is all done over here. So, and again, you get, uh, I think everything in here is a Porsche right now. So we get a lot of Porsches. So you got a couple of 935, got three 935s in here and a 934 and a half and two 962s and a 907. So there's a, a complete assortment of Porsche race cars in here. And uh, um, several of them are in for complete restorations. The 907 is, is a ground up restoration project. Then the, the Kremer K4 935 is also a ground up restoration project as is the 962 on that in the tub that was sitting down there. The rest of these cars are maintenance and upgrades and repairs and, and getting them ready to race. The, the thing about the race cars is most of these cars are used regularly in vintage races now and, and it's not like you just take this car and shine it up and go drive it. They, they have to really get a full maintenance program every time they run. You have to inspect everything, make sure nothing's cracked, make sure nothing's falling off service everything, service the brake system, service the engines. Um, it's, it's, pretty, uh, um, it's pretty extensive, um, especially these kind of cars because they're, they're fast and they, uh, they have tremendous loads on everything, on suspension, on, hand, on the bodies, on, on the engines, everything, uh, pretty extreme. So, so every time they run, a lot of these cars is taken down like this, worked on, and then put back together again. And, that, and maybe it only had three hours of runtime and had to do that again. So that's kind of normal. And, and again, everything is done here. We, um, we, we do these 962 engines, the 917 engines, the 935 engines are all done in our engine shop. And um, uh, gearboxes we do here, chassis setup, you know, and then, and then all the other miscellaneous repairs that, to, to keep these cars going. When we were upstairs, you saw the Rothman 962 and uh, the, the, uh, the 962 Group C car, and this is one of those cars disassembled. So if you take the nose off and you take the tail off and you take the engine off, which bolts to the back of the tub, that's the whole tub right there. That's all there is to it. It's uh, pretty minimalist. It's, uh, you know, this car is an aluminum tub. The 962 that we walked by down there, the white car, that was a carbon tub. 
but uh, that's what a 962 looks like when it's taken apart. So back here is a lot of, a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's, it's completed customer cars, it's cars in process, um, it's a little bit of everything. That, that's, that is the Carrera GT prototype. So that's chassis 01, that was the first Carrera GT. That car defined what the car was going to look like and then they built a production one um, in 04. That's actually a 2000 model car. Um, and it's the only one in existence. This is a customer's Ford GT that we're just prepping for delivery. Brand new Ford GT done in Sunoco blue. Um, um, so I'll let you guess who might own that car. So uh, um, this is a Nissan championship car from the, Nis from the GTP era. Nissan won the championship in the early 90s. These cars made 1150 horsepower and they made 8,000 pounds of downforce. They, uh, they were wicked fast. They were faster than Indy cars at every track that they both raced at. So if, if Indianapolis cars were at Portland, when IMSA showed up with these cars, they were faster. At Laguna, these were faster. Um, at, at Road America, they were faster than an Indy car. It took Indy car several years to get faster than these cars were. They had so much grip and so much power. Um, they, they actually, the, the last of the GTP cars, the Toyota, and there's one up there in the rack, held the track record at Daytona till this last year. It was only this year that they finally broke that record from 1993. Uh, there's another 917 that, that we finished a restoration not that long ago. Um, you know, another 962 customer car we take care of and just an assortment of things, a Bugatti EB110 and, you know, it, it just too much stuff. Anyway, on the rack, there's customer cars in storage. There's some cars for sale. Uh, there's a little bit of everything. Stock cars, two more stock cars, both David Pearson cars, the Torino and the, and both of those Torinos, basically the, uh, the one on top in the blue car. And, uh, Here's a John Paul Corvette. We restored this car. It was, I mean, this thing's a monster. 750 horsepower, 500 cubic inch uh, IMSA car from the days. Okay, so I hope you got to see enough cars. Um, you know, thanks to a lot of really great customers, we also have a lot of really cool cars here. And they let us work on these cars. They let us sell them these cars. They let us resell some of these cars. They let us modify these cars. Some of my customers let me drive these cars. We, we get our car fix here on a daily basis. And uh, you can imagine how lucky I am to get to come to work and do something I love every single day. I've always told everybody, find something you're passionate about and it's never gonna be work. And that's exactly what this is. So uh, hope you enjoyed it.